going to go with the rest of that first. And then after that, lovely Warren, and then Alex White. Good evening. Good evening. This illustrious table here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Though, I read about this this morning in the paper. I didn't receive the invitation directly. But upon reading about it, I said, I know I need to be there. So here I am. Um, it's been very interesting. It's one word. Disturbing is probably a more fitting word than um, the things I've heard this evening. Disturbing on a number of levels, not the least of which is that we don't sustain the fight, as you said. Of the speakers who shared their stories, by and large, when asked, what was the officer's name? Did you report it? Or did you file a claim? Or something along those lines. The answer was often no. Now, it may be just out of disgust that nothing's going to happen if we do. But you can be sure that nothing will happen if you don't. So what we on city council are charged with is providing governance, legislative oversight, even looking at the Civilian Re Review Board. And one of the points that was made, I think you were talking about the professional standards. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad. Yeah. yeah. I've been over there, but I hadn't thought about it in the way that you couched that. that that's intriguing to me. We need to look at that. We, it's, it's been brought to our attention. This is not new. But as you said, something happens, it flames up, then it goes away. We have to keep the fire burning. You gotta keep the fire on our feet too. So that if there's something that we need to advance, if there are legislative initiatives that we need to put on the table and get the support of our colleagues and get you behind us to, to push them forward, to get the community engaged, all segments of the community, because what we also have to acknowledge is that what happens in on Jefferson and Frost, for example, is not necessarily what happens on Merchants and Wynn or Eastern Alexander. So any effort to reduce the level of policing can be met with very strong resistance. There's not always the understanding that policing in your neighborhood or mine is not the same thing. So we have to be consistent in trying to make sure that message gets delivered. It's, I don't know what it tells us about the number of people who are here tonight. Maybe they didn't hear you. But it, I don't think it adequately speaks to the depth of this issue and the amount of concern that people have. As a current city council member and one who hopes to be reelected, I can commit to you that I'm willing to work on this. I'm willing to let you light the fire under my feet and try to keep this thing moving. I do appreciate you being here tonight and listening to me. Thank you, Council Member Scott, to our clergy and everyone that's here this evening. We have serious work to do in our community with our relations between our police department and the neighborhood. We recognize that. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that we don't have a problem. City Council, about two years ago, we heard the cries of the community and we have tried to start that process. Uh, we have come to our churches and to our clergy and since 1979, we're on a consent, under a consent decree by the federal government to diversify uh, our police department. And, you know, we never fulfilled that requirement. But this past year, we were able to graduate more African Americans, Latino, and women in both our peace, police department and fire department than ever before because of the community's help, because of our clergy's help, and I have to say our chief's help as well. I think that this gentleman said that 
if you are able to relate and you think about the people as your neighbor, we are partners in this. We cannot be adversaries because that doesn't do anything to build our community, to bring hope to our community. Only thing it does is divide us. And so we have to work collectively together. So I commend you for having uh, the police here, the, the clergy, as well as the community to have this discussion because we have to stop talking about it and start doing things about it. And I think that that's what you're trying to do here. Um, as long as I can remember, uh, I was born and raised in this city. There has been a number of issues with the changes in the way we police, two police stations, uh, you know, one on the east side, one on the west side. People not have a relationship with their officers. A number of years ago, and about two years ago, my house was robbed. I was the city council president. You know how long it took for a black <coughs> police officer to get there? Five hours. Mm. Five hours. So I'm in the same boat as everyone in this room. The rest of the same boat as everyone in this room. It is the way we provide the service. When you have a system that you're just constantly responding, constantly responding, and your, your, your uh, attitude and your adrenaline is running to these, um, these 911 calls, there are times when you do not act appropriately. And we need to call that out. But we also need to have partners in the community and build those relationships that we have to do in order to maintain. Because you know what, when something happens, when somebody's murdered, when somebody's you know, going through domestic violence, we call the police. We dial 911. And you see something happening, you know, you know, children getting jumped, we call 911. And so we have to know that that's a partnership, that's a relationship that needs to be built. And it cannot be an adversarial one. I, um, you know, I worked with the, the chief on, uh, you know, a young man was uh, two o'clock in the morning walking home from school, University of Rochester. Police came, pulled out their guns on him, made him lay flat down on the ground, and, you know, he just kept saying his name, and I had my ID in my pocket. I had my ID in my pocket. The young man was traumatized. You know, his parents, you know, called me, called Loretta, you know, called the chief. This cannot continue to happen to our young people. And when they asked him for his ID and found out that he didn't have a gun, they didn't take him home. They didn't say, you know, let's get in the car, let's take him home, we know you're walking. They left him there. And so we have to do a better job at building those relationships. When they found out that they were a college student, they could have took them home. Or they could have said, you know what, you know, do you need a ride or, or, or whatever. And those are little gestures that would have gone a long way. Now they, they might have got a call saying that somebody was out there, but that was a little gesture that could have went a long, long way. And the same thing, I was just not, you know, they attacked me, you know, the other day because I was talking about the, the Hardaway situation. And when I went to meet uh, and sat down with my mother, and she said, when the African-American officer came in and he said to me, ma'am, if you calm down, your children will calm down. Mm -hmm. You know, that's yeah. recognizing that there's a relationship there. Mm -hmm. And that didn't have to just come from an African-American officer, but knowledge and experience and being told, listen, this is how this particular situation, you can diffuse it with just a little bit mm -hmm. of kindness and go into her and say, ma'am, and respect on both sides have to happen. We have work to do in this community. I am committed to making sure that we, be, that we build on that and that we build our relationships with our clergy. Because coming to the, the church we recognize that we were able to diversify our police department and our fire department. We know that we can do better by doing things like this, but also we have to go outside these four walls and take it to the community. I'm committed to doing that. I'm committed to working with all of you. I've worked with you in the past, 
and we'll work together in the future. I thank you for having me this evening and having this discussion. Washington Square Park 
And I was standing there when Police Shepherd, Shepherd walks over to the press and says, you guys can go home, we're all done. And the press said, well, we're going to wait till you arrest Emily Good. And Shepherd said, oh, we're not going to do that tonight. And then the press left. And the police arrested Emily Good. See, when, when a number of police officers were found by the newspaper, by the way, not by the police, not by any internal investigation, but by our newspaper, thank goodness, who was paying attention, and they were found to be voiding thousands of parking tickets for friends and family, I think this is a crime. I'm not a lawyer again, but I'm pretty certain that's a crime. The punishment was a nasty letter in their personal file. Under these conditions, we cannot expect the officers who are committing the problems to ever change their behavior because there is no punishment, no management, and no supervision in our department. I'm Alex White. I'm here to change that. So we can walk our streets safely and be correctly policed. Our officers should all have cameras on them so that the officers in an incident can have it reviewed and our civilian review board, which has real teeth, which has subpoena power, investigative power, and the right to, to, rec the right to recommend to an independent arbiter uh, punishments, should have the right to review every single case of disorderly conduct in the city of Rochester, every single case of, of, of uh, uh, obstructing a government agent in every single case that looks suspicious in any way or which someone gets hurt by a police officer. And I'm going to keep going until we see that. Thank you. Does the investigation. 
they do an investigation. And we're called to put together a panel of civilians who live in Rochester, and we have to live in Rochester, we have to live in the, in the, in the community that we serve, and we review that investigation for fairness, timeliness, and thoroughness. And then we make a recommended finding, and then that goes to the, um, to the rest of the process, and then ultimately to the, to the chief of police. But we need to police themselves. Well, that's the process that happens. They do the investigation, and again, we're the, the, the uh, review panelists are trained as neutrals, if you will. We're, we're, we're trained as professional mediators and marshals to look at every everything that, that has been done in that investigation. If something's missing, we ask for it. We get everything we ask for. If, this, if we think something's not right, we ask for it. If, that, if we can't get it from the investigating sergeant, we go up to the lieutenant. If we can't get it from the lieutenant, we'll go to the chief. And if the chief doesn't get it to us, then we go to the city council. So we, the process, it, 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 it is what it is at this point, but that's right now what it is. Now, is it correct that the council has the final decision in the process? Is that correct? There's two questions. Um, Excuse me, there's two questions here, so I don't want to answer first. Go ahead, now. Go ahead. All I, want, all I was asking is, does the chief have the final word in the process? In this process, yes. Thank you.